It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Had a had, had a bunch of emails on our show about raising uh, the uh, family home time, raising the number of hours we get to do anything else but work. Uh, Bernie Sanders, as we talked about, put up forth a messaging bill, and he even admitted it's not going to pass. But the idea of moving the country to a 32-hour work week. And the responses, while many very positive, saying, hey, it's about time we start looking at better family time, more time to, to do whatever it is we want to do, a large number of people giving me the line that, hey, I can't make it on 48 hours. How am I supposed to make it on 32? Well, the idea was uh, that Sanders has is that you make um, 32 hours, pay what 40 used to, and then some. The idea of overtime after eight hours, which one person took the task. How dare you think that we should have overtime after eight hours? Who could possibly do that? Uh, every union job I have ever had. You know, when I entered the workforce, uh, overtime after eight was the norm for working people. And somehow over these 35 plus years of, uh, of work, that has been diminished to where, you know, now they're saying, you know, even full overtime after 40, we can, we should be able to wiggle around that, you know, work people a hundred hours one week and then, you know, not so much the rest of the month. Yeah. Uh, other people said that businesses would have to shut down and stop hiring workers. And another person told me that businesses can't afford any more of your liberal regulations. And it got me to thinking. As I was reading through the Oxfam report, uh, as you know, the uh, the British nonprofit every year comes out with uh, their their corporate uh, examination, if you will, a new report every once in a while. This one analyzing more than 200 U.S. corporations. Uh, I I like the the word that they used uh, to assess their inequality footprint. Uh, it basically means they're creating more inequality and screwing over working people for themselves. And what we found, not surprising, what they found was uh, of the profits created in these these big corporations, a, a lot of it, a lot of it went to paying shareholders. And when I say a lot, I mean 90% of it. Uh, there were a combined $1.25 trillion in net profit for the companies that they looked at. And $1.1 trillion of that went to, uh, well, $448 billion of it went to paying dividends, uh, you know, for people who have stock, who just collect checks every month. Uh, and then a, a record $681 billion in stock buybacks. Uh, you've heard me talk about how much I hate stock buybacks because, you know, that money, all of that, that $681 billion in stock buybacks in the old days before the Reagan era. I remember I talk about the Reagan era a lot and how it was the beginning of the destruction of the American working class and the worst administration ever for working people. But if you're a rich guy, oh, oh he was golden. Um, he was the goose that laid the golden egg over and over. And in fact, after he's dead, still laying the golden egg because what he allowed to come back into existence were these stock buybacks, which only enriched the very wealthy and $681 billion of them uh, in the year that they examined. And the thing that gets me is um, when people say we can't afford a 32 hour work week because businesses won't be able to afford it. Oh, yeah, they can. They just won't be able to buy $681 billion in stock buybacks back. Look at look at Mark Zuckerberg over at Meta. Uh, they announced that they were going to lay off 10,000 workers. It's the year of efficiency. While at the same time, announcing another $40 billion in stock buybacks. Um. They're going to do another fifty billion as well, and you go, but but how they but but efficiency, uh, uh 
They don't care about working people. They care about profit. Now, when I talk about stock, buy stock buybacks, um, you look at the big ones. Between 2018 and 2022, the four biggest stock buyback people, Lowe's, almost $40 billion, Home Depot, almost $40 billion, Walmart, $35 billion, Starbucks, Starbucks, $31.7 billion. What do all of them have in common? All of them are, have in common is low-wage jobs. If those were all union jobs, Starbucks on their way, these would be jobs that would have living wages, excellent health care, retirement security, job security, all of the things that you come to expect in a union job. Oh, yeah, and being part of the middle class. FedEx. FedEx actually reduced its median salary by 22% and then, well, decided that they were going to enrich themselves. So throw themselves a little party and, and buy about $6 billion in stock back. Again, I go back to 2022, a record of $681 billion in stock back back. And understand, that's not even including, no, no, not even including all the money that we give to CEOs, which between 2018 and 2022 increased by 31%. 2021 alone, according to Oxfam, uh, CEOs of these 200 companies, uh, Combined $4.1 billion, 33% increase over what they were paid in 2018. You've got six companies, Alphabet, Amazon, Intel, Oracle, Blackstone, KKNR, paid their CEOs over $100 million. Think about that. In one year, you got several companies like McDonald's and Coca-Cola who their, their CEOs, over 1,500 to one over their average workers. And then you go, but Rick, you know, they work really hard uh, at McDonald's. Not one of those CEOs uh, poured a, a fountain soda. Not one of those people flipped a hamburger. Nobody uh, dipped a basket of fries. None of that. Not one of them said, hey, would you like fries with that? No. <laughs> they don't even, they probably wouldn't even know how to flip a burger. But they get to make well, the CEO of McDonald's made 1,745 to one. And the thing is, is we keep saying that we can't afford to pay workers more, but yet nobody seems to say, aren't we paying the wealth class a little too much? Aren't they, aren't they doing too well? I know, but Rick, it's America, land of the opportunity. And these, these Wall Street greedy types, they could, should get all that they can. Now, you got 82% of the these companies have presence in, in these in one, at least one tax haven. They spent almost $800 million in lobbying in 2022 because they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to pay their workers. And you go... Explain to me why people are emailing me and, and sending me messages saying, Rick, we can't afford to move to a 32-hour work week. We can't afford to raise the minimum wage. We can't afford to help granny by raising the Social Security COLA. We can't help working people because, hey, we've got an investor class to feed. It's kind of crazy once you sit down and think about it. I mean, honestly and truthfully, when you look at these numbers, the amount of wealth that this country generates and to have working people who have to ask for help in the way of food stamps or housing assistance or heating assistance or school lunches for their kids, working people who have to be humiliated because the wages that they earn are too low because, well, they just, I don't know, didn't get lucky that day. It's rather, again, rather insane where we find ourselves. No. There is a lot of organizing going on. And as I said a moment ago, Starbucks, um, you know, <laughs> a, one of the big buyback companies, their workers are organizing, saying, you know what, that wealth that we create that you're buying the stock back with, we want some of it. That is our money. We earned that. And this is what working people across the country are going to have to do. Look, government's not going to help. Uh, we've got a Republican Party hell-bent on stopping any progress. We've got a Senate that's stuck in, in neutral because of the filibuster. 
no matter what Joe Biden wants, our House of Representatives and our Senate are not going to send pro-worker legislation to him. Until one, we vote people in who will send him the legislation. And two, we as working people get back out in the streets and say we we demand better. Because the numbers that I just laid out are totally outrageous and should never, ever be allowed to exist. We need to raise taxes on these very wealthy people and use that money in a much better way. And I argue if we went back to the good socialist president, Dwight Eisenhower's tax code, tax these people at 92%, you might see some of that actually trickle down. Maybe. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at rickatherricksmithshow.com. Quick break. When we come back, Raymond Jensen's going to be here from the UAW on a big win. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So on Wednesday, some pretty big news. Uh, The workers at Volkswagen in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, they filed a petition with the National Labor Relations Board for, uh, yeah, a union election. Uh, They have filed to join the union, the UAW, according to the UAW's press release. Uh, They have a super majority of the cards signed uh, at Volkswagen in just 100 days. Now, understand, Volkswagen, uh, that Chattanooga Chattanooga plant, the only Volkswagen plant in the U.S. employing more than 4,000 people. And, And here's a little tidbit. The only Volkswagen plant in the entire world, on the entire planet, uh, with zero form of employee representation. So this could be could be a big deal. Uh, could also a big deal that this is the first of what I hope is many uh, foreign auto plants here in the U.S. to file for a union election. So we will see. But good news. Uh, you remember a couple weeks ago we had uh, UAW folks on talking about Westport Axle Company? Well, t- yesterday was the big day, uh, the big election, and here to share some thoughts on, well, how that turned out. I've asked Raymond Jensen to come talk with us. He's UAW Region 9 Assistant Director. Raymond, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me on, as always, Rick. It's a pleasure. So some pretty good news coming out of the international. Let's talk about what's going on in the Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area of Pennsylvania. What what, what happened? Yeah, so uh, yesterday they filed for their election, or they, they had their election, excuse me. And, uh, you know, the company hired the biggest law firm, uh, which Amazon used, Morgan Lewis and Brachius. And um, we defeated them. Uh, those workers at Westport won their union. And we are now welcoming to the UAW family. Um, they just been frustrated. The company's just been not, you know, same old story. They just been treating them like garbage, sending them home without pay when there's downtime. Um, so it is what it is. And, and the labor movement is hot and they said enough is enough. And we went down there and we organized them. And uh, yesterday they are, they're going to be welcome to the UAW family. Now, you know, before we went on air, you, you, you said something. You said, we organized them. It sounded like they organized themselves. They did. They did. Um, we, we basically assisted them. You are correct. Uh, so there was 147 workers. And out of the 147 workers, they had 35 members on their VOC, wow. Voluntary Organizing Committee. And uh, some, about 75% of the membership is Spanish-speaking, which the company thought they were going to use to try to defeat us. Uh, we brought in an organizer who was fluent in Spanish. Uh, we printed up flyers uh, in English and in Spanish, and uh, we took it to them. You know, we uh, we 
showed the workers how much money they were spending, $3,500 a day per attorney. Uh, we showed the workers how much money they were getting in tax breaks and incentives um, to be there and operate. And uh, we just took everything they did and we turned it against them. And they basically, you're right, they organized themselves and we just assisted. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you see these companies hire the, the well, the biggest anti-union law firm in the country and then the tactics that they, that they, they, they employ. Uh, but when you've got an active and engaged workforce who's who's demanding that they get better wages, they get the better benefits, they have a safe workplace, they have dignity um, or a chance at dignity, they're going to grab it. Absolutely, they are. And we see it happening all over the country. I mean, everybody wants to be a part of the UAW now. Uh, the labor movement across this country, what President Fain has done, um, what other unions have done, what the Teamsters have done. Um, it's just everybody's on fire right now. And and again, I take it back to COVID and I think COVID exposed all these employers, but the time is now. And if we don't take the, the moment to seize this opportunity, the window might close and we might never get it again. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, so walk me through how this, how this happens. So other people who might be going, hey, you know what? I'm tired of getting the short end of the stick. I'm tired of uh, being used and abused and, and all of that. You know, how'd this, how'd this start? How did it start? What was the process going through? So basically, Westport Axel is about a mile down the road from uh, Mack Trucks, local 677. And uh, some members from, you know, Westport Axel knew some members from Mack Trucks and reached out and said, hey, what do we have to do? We, we saw the contract that you guys received. You know, we want to be part of the UAW. Um, they were in touch. They put them in touch with our servicing rep. The servicing rep basically called the region, um, but any member could call the region, whatever area they're in across the country. Just call the you know regional office and just say, hey, I want to be part of the UAW. Um, and then the region will uh, make sure that you have the resources um, and whatever it is you need. you know. And once you sign those cards, let's not forget, once you sign those cards, you have protection. So if the company files, you know, or the company fires you or tries to, to bring up some BS against you, we follow, we'll follow charges and more than likely we will get you back because we have a labor friendly NLRB right now. And um, everything is, all the pieces are falling in place. So um, I, I encourage everybody, if you're out there and you're being mistreated, you're not getting the proper wages, you're not getting your dignity or respect, um, call, call a regional office, wh whoever you want to organize with, whether it's the Teamsters, UAW, Steelworkers, IBW, it doesn't matter. Just join a union and make your life better. No, no. As a young kid, I, I saw that right before my very eyes, the concept of union job, better life. Uh, and and that's, that's for me, has been the reality. But, you know, here's the here's the thing. We're in this in this moment where, you know, I just had someone on from from your organization talking about, hey, this is we've, we've done the organizing. We filed the petition and it wasn't that long ago. Um, this was a fairly speedy process, you know, given the last several years of, of employers being able to draw this stuff out to harass and intimidate their employees. Uh, this was a fairly quick deal. And I, I'm going to ask, is this because uh, of the, who the Biden administration has put into place or is it something that I don't know? Absolutely. It's because of who the Biden administration has put in place. And I'll give you an example. So this is the third bite at the apple for the Volkswagen folks. Uh, the last time they uh, filed for an election and they kept drawing it out, drawing it out, drawing it out until Trump was in office. And then once Trump took office, it just died out because the workers lost interest because it was so long. Um, we filed for an election two weeks ago and we have our election. Um, and as of yesterday, like I said, the workers won their union. Um, it, it's just unbelievable how things, when you have the right labor friendly administration in place that people want to make the lives better for everybody. It's amazing how things happen. And um, I'm not going to tell anybody how to vote and I'm not going to go down that road. But you know what? The administration that's in office right now has proven time and time again that they're labor friendly and that they're willing, how, willing to help out the labor movement in this country. No, this is this is a big deal for me. And, and I think it's a really important one to point out, which is why I did, because, you know, We've seen throughout the years when there are Republicans in the White House, the people that they put in the, in the head of the Department of Labor uh, and in the NLRB always draw this stuff out because what they know. And well, let me let me ask you, uh, 
how do employers and and these big union busting law firms uh, how do they feel about drawing things out what what's the the outcome generally when they're able to draw things out i don't want to make my own conclusion i want you to say it when you draw things out the workers lose interest the workers lose momentum and when when the workers are fired up and when the workers are ready to go they want to see results they don't want to hear well we'll do it in six months we'll do it in eight months we'll do it in nine months because then it gives the company opportunity to launch their campaign and to hold these captive audience meetings and just to wear you down like to wear these workers down and they peel you off one by one and they they claim that the union is a third party and they're going to come in here and they're going to you know they're going to sell your information they're going to take your rights away and it's just the total opposite they use every tactic in the book and it's a shame because all we're trying to do is better the lives of people who've been mistreated for years and everybody deserves to have dignity and respect and just to make a fair wage in this country yeah no what we see is you know numerous mandatory captive audience meetings what we see is punitive discipline and 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 constant harassment and ultimately you see workers getting fired uh, which has, a, as someone who's done some organizing in the past, uh, that has a chilling effect across the whole thing. So the longer an employer has to draw this out, uh, to, to pull out all of the bag of the tricks of the union busting law firms, um, they know they got a better chance of winning, which is why I think having elections in a timely manner, uh, well, reaps positive uh, outcomes like this one. Absolutely. And I mean, I don't know how many attorneys they had working. I wasn't on the ground with the organizers, but at $3,500 a day, they were down there for at least a couple of weeks. So even at one attorney, you're looking at $50,000 they just spent easily when they could have invested that money into their workers. And maybe, you know, the workers would have been like, hey, they actually do care about us, but no, they were sending them home without pay when, when Mack trucks was going down due to part supply issues. Um, and then once the union got involved and they offered them raises, they were going to, the CEO was going to come and cook them hamburgers. Um, <laughs> it's amazing locked, how that happens. They locked down the VOC. They were apparently on jobs where they could move around inside the facility and the company locked them down on jobs so they couldn't communicate with their other workers. But the problem is for them, our, our organizers were out there at the beginning and end of each shift to talk to those workers and just say, Hey, stay strong. Our election is on this day. And they just, constantly talk to those workers and some of them were getting nervous some of them were, were scared but a good organizer will will talk to a worker and that's what they're there for and convince them like hey this company if they really cared about you they would have invested in you a long time ago not just when the union's coming around so they held their captive audience meetings they did all their tricks in the book but you know what we i can say that we defeated the biggest law firm anti-union busting law firm in the country uh, yesterday. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm ecstatic for those workers to, to make a better way of living and uh, have dignity and respect. Good on, good on them. Now, this uh, this obviously a big victory, a good victory. Uh, but you got some more some campaigns coming up on the near future uh, that, that we were talking about the University of Penn, right? Yes, uh, the U of Penn. We've been working on that for a while. Uh, it'll be roughly around, I think, 4,500, give or take. Uh, that election is happening April 16th and 17th. Um, and the same thing, when COVID hit, um, the U of Penn so told the international workers, you can't stay here, you have to go home. And they said, but the border's closed. And they said, we don't care, you can't stay here, you have to leave. So they all pulled their money together to get some housing in and around you know, the campus um, to stay there. And they wonder why that they want to join a union, right? They wonder why that they, they're they you know doing this. Uh, we just filed, we, um, we filed on Monday for an auto dealership in Flemington, New Jersey. There's 13 auto techs, 11 of them signed cards. But the good news is the, the, the family that owns the dealership owns 42 other stores. So guess what? We're coming after those ones as well. Wow. So, so Region you know, 9 is about to be on fire. Good on you for this. But, you know, this, this gets me to another point. Uh, that that all workers can join a union at the end of the day. And I say this all the time. Um, every CEO in this country has a contract. Uh, all of their terms of employment, all of their benefits, all of their wage structure, everything is written out, laid out in black and white. Why is that not good enough for every single worker? And I, I say every worker should demand at least what the CEO gets in terms of a contract. Uh, I know they're not going to be as lucrative, not anywhere near as lucrative, but you should still, you should have a contract. Absolutely, you should. Uh, all workers should be organized in this country. 
And um, I read an article the other day, I believe it was three families in the United States owns more wealth than half the population of this world. Yep. That's disgusting. That is absolutely disgusting. Those workers are the ones that make those people the profits and these corporations and these giants, you know, CEOs, conglomerates. I don't even know what you call them anymore. But you know what? We saw what happened with the big three and it's trickling down to every worker in this country and they all need to be organized. And as I said earlier, we would love to have them in the UAW, but I don't care who you organize with, organize and join a union and make your life better. Last line of questioning I've got for you, because clearly you know, the, the election is a huge hurdle. Uh, winning that is a big hurdle. Now the, now the next st stage begins. Uh, that, that you know, fighting for a contract, uh, getting better wages, hours, conditions, all of the things uh, that workers want, need, and earn. Um, one, how hard is this going to be? Because we've seen other employers that have drugged this out. And two, uh, and I think, you know, just as importantly, uh, I think we need major comprehensive labor law reform in this country to make that second part, that getting a first contract uh, much easier and mandatory, that it actually happens within a timely manner. But I want to hear your thoughts on, on this situation. So I just actually, before I came on, I just actually had a, a phone call with our servicing rep. Um, he's the one that services Mack Trucks. He comes out of Mack Trucks. And I said, Kevin, you know, now let's go get their first contract. And uh, I see what the, the Starbucks workers have went through, um, and I'm not throwing shade on anybody, but I think the UAW is going to carry a little more clout, and I, I don't think they're going to want to drag this out because we're going to make sure that we start bargaining for their first contract. We can file, you know, we can file charges against them. Uh, if needed, we can bring in international president. Uh, I'm not going to speak for him, but we have all the resources, um, legal, Whatever it is, our service and rep is going to go in there and start demanding dates to bargain. But you are right. We do need comprehensive labor law reform in this country because when the workers voice their opinion to form a union, the companies need to say, OK, you know what? These workers have spoken and we need to make sure that their lives are better now. And that's the end of it. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So I agree with you. There you go, Raymond. I appreciate the time. Anything we can do to help, uh, we're here for you. Uh, and congratulations on yesterday's victory and, and congratulations to those workers. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, and I truly appreciate it as always, Rick. Good stuff. Raymond Jensen, UAW Region 9 Assistant Director. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, you see all of this organizing going on. You see all of this energy going on. Uh, all for the hope, the dream, the well, the, the path to making better lives. Uh, at the end of the day, as I've said, union job, better life. That's simple. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Back after this. Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So the Center for American Progress has got a new report out uh, up and how you know how updating Social Security's the supplemental income uh, would help Im improve people's lives. Uh, the new analysis from the center shows uh, that households relying on supplemental S security income (SSI). Uh, they face higher financial risks and how updating this would make people's lives better. Uh, I got to tell you, you know, in you talk about Social Security, you talk about the disability benefits, you talk about all of the things that make people's lives better. And as I've said on this show before, uh, when I was a kid, my mother passed when I was 13. Uh, we, we, My grandparents got the death benefit uh, that helped them afford to raise me, not a cheap child. Uh, I ate them out of house and hold, but it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to help. Uh, we should be expanding these things to help make lives better. But here to share some thoughts on, well, what SSI expanding that, updating it would do. I've asked Beth Almeida to come talk with us. She's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, AmericanProgress.org, their website, if you want to take a look at the work that they do. Beth, thanks for taking time for us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rick. So walk me through, let's get some terms out first, because, you know, we hear about Social Security, we hear about uh, Social Security disability, we hear about the death benefit, uh, and now SSI. What, what What's all this mean? Yeah, yeah. It's um, 
So SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is definitely often confused for you know either Social Security or Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. So it's like a big alphabet soup, but essentially what we're talking about when we talk about SSI is this is kind of the quintessential safety net program. This is for the folks who um, either when they turn 65 and they're older, and they don't have a long enough work history in regular social security, or they they never earned enough, or especially for women, they took breaks to you know raise, raise the kids children. or raise grandkids, right? So um, their earnings over their career were were not very high. So this is sort of like a minimum floor, a minimum benefit for people who are older under social security. The other thing that it does is it um, provides support for people who are disabled and cannot work. Okay, so they're never, they don't ever have the opportunity to build up earnings in Social Security because they're unable to work due to a disability. Um, about seven and a half million people a year are benefiting from this program, including about a million kids. You know, the kids, um, I, I, I'm glad you shared that story, Rick, because, you know, people forget about the fact that Social Security um, helps people of all ages and about a million kids, um, disabled kids, get benefits from SSI every year. No, it's it's an important thing. But, you know, the sad reality is, is uh, what we've seen over the last, well, my entire lifetime is an assault on all of these programs, uh, making her high hurdles or obstacles or, you know, all of this stuff that you have to go through to get it. it it's it's a Herculean leap in a lot of cases to be able to, to weed through these programs as they've been put up to, you know, to try and block people from them. Because, you know, the, I guess the concept or the theory is everyone's trying to cheat the system. Uh, when in reality, this isn't this isn't a great lifestyle. Uh, the benefits are are meager, because uh, I know a lot of people who who sadly have to be, depend on this. Uh, but what we've allowed to happen is these to be whittled down to where they're they're just above poverty wage uh, livings. Or, or am I missing something? No, absolutely. That's absolutely the case. So the average benefit last year was about six hundred fifty dollars a month. So you know that that's not a lot. That is not a lot to cover. Just even your most basic needs, rent, food, medicine, you know, transportation, gas in the tank, that, that 650 bucks doesn't go very far. Um, and that was the average benefit last year. Um, you know, the other thing is your point about um, all of the hurdles that people have to go through. That's certainly true. In SSI, um, qualifying for the program is really, really a steep climb. It's difficult. So you not only have to prove that you have a disability or that you're over 65, okay? And, and that's not, you know, over 65, that's just a birth certificate, right? But, you know, in terms of, you know, you have to be not just disabled, but you have to be disabled enough to qualify. About two thirds of people who apply for benefits, who are disabled and apply for benefits, don't get it. They're denied. At some point, somewhere along in the process, only one th one in three um, applicants actually ultimately is successful in getting benefits. So this isn't the type of thing where you know this is easy to qualify for. There are a lot of those hurdles and hoops you have to jump through. The other thing about SSI, which um, makes it different than Social Security disability or Social Security benefits generally, is that this is considered a um, a program of last resort. And that phrase actually comes from the Social Security Administration. This is assistance of last resort. So what that means is if you have any amount of income, if you have any amount of assets, you're supposed to rely on those. And the government is only going to supplement that if, um, you know, it's it's a very low amount. You yeah, know, if you're, you're so, basically broke, you're indigent, you've got nothing. And this is the thing absolutely. that drives me crazy about a lot of the means testing, like in my state of Pennsylvania, where you can't you can't get food stamps if you got a, a, a car or a couple of thousand dollars in assets. It's this stuff that makes these programs so hard to get. And, I, and look, I think there are some uh, there are some, you know, wearing a, a certain political hat uh, that want it that way so that people don't get access to these programs. You know, it's um, in, I would say in SSI's case, um, 
you know, it's like the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? We've all heard that, heard that. So, you know, I mean, certainly there's a sense that for a last resort type program like SSI, you know, yes, if people have, have the means to be able to, you know, support themselves and, you know, pay, pay for their expenses, that's one thing. But um, one of the things that's really important for folks to realize is that these limits on how much you can earn, on how much you can have in the bank, for us and, and still be eligible, still maintain eligibility for SSI, have not been updated since the program began. Now, I was in kindergarten. Hold on, wait a second. Wait a second. 10. I was in kindergarten, Rick. I mean, look at this gray hair. I was in kindergarten when this program was established, 1972. They have not been updated for the cost of living. They have not been updated to reflect, you know, increase in wages. Um, they are it's still in the same place that they were when this program was established. I'm, I'm, I'm Which trying is pretty to, shocking. You I know, it's, I'm, I'm literally it's, it's rare that I don't have words, um, but I'm thinking about it. You know, the same the same amount 1972 as today. Absolutely. So right now, in order to get the full benefit under SSI, you cannot have more than sixty five dollars in earned income, which is wages, okay? So you could have like a part of a part of a part of a part-time job, <laughs> $65, not much, right? You can only have $20 in unearned income. Now, unearned income, keep in mind, also includes things like in-kind support, even stuff you might get from a family member. So for instance, let's say I have a disabled brother um, and I've got a spare bedroom in my house and I say, you know, I know rents are going crazy. I know you have very few resources to live on. Move into my spare bedroom. The Social Security Administration is going to consider that in-kind income, in-kind unearned income. So they're going to attach a value, a rental equivalent value, and then say, you know, my brother is getting that as income, unless I charge him rent. So it, it forces people and families into these totally contorted kinds of situations where, you know, the, the natural tendency that, that we all have as people to, you know, support our families and do what we can to help when we can, um, creates all these, you know, the, the program creates all these perverse, weird incentives um, that just goes to show what happens when you don't update things for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the asset limit, for instance, you can't have more than $2,000 in assets. Um, and still qualify for benefits. And if you go even one dollar above that limit, they kick you off. And yeah. if you were, you know, for any length of time, you know, over that limit, you're gonna ha they're gonna recoup those benefits. So it really creates a huge amount of hardship for people. And a disincentive. And again, and a, and a, if these, oh, go ahead. No, and a disincentive to try and work. Um, yes. You know, I I know someone who is is on he's, he's disabled. Um, you know, he has, he, he's blind and I know what he, he gets and from the, and I, I know what these limits are and, you know, he's one of the most capable people I know, but can't work because they'll take the, the meager benefits and the health care that he, he's able to, to get, um, because then he's making too much, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah. The incentives are all backwards. They're completely backwards. And the point you make about health care is a really good one. Cause you know, when you're talking about folks who are elderly, folks and folks who have disabilities and folks who are both elderly and disabled. Healthcare is a huge deal, right? It's a huge thing. And so losing your healthcare, you know, losing your benefits, it's not just the monthly income that you're losing. You're potentially your healthcare benefits are at risk. And that's a ma massive problem if you're someone who has, you know, higher health needs due to a disability. So, um, so, you know, this, this stuff is really like so long overdue to be, um, updated you know 40 years is way too long yeah, I think to, so. uh, you know to update this stuff it's shocking you know to to think that this is a thing but i think it because ssi is it's not the 800 pound girl it's not like the mainline social security program it's sort of like this little thing that's off to the side that people don't pay attention to so much i i think people don't even realize that um, if this had just kept pace with inflation, for instance, the asset test, that $2,000 limit, it would be about five times as large. It should be $10,000 today. No, and, and the amount just, that you're able to earn, because uh, we want people to, to try and, and work. We want people to you know give it a shot. 
Um, you know, I, that that's just it, it's mind boggling to me that we we put these cliffs in place to where even if you that if you try, you're penalized. Yeah, it's completely the wrong way to do it. So how do, you we, know, how do we update this? So how do we get to a place where this is uh, more sane? Yeah. Well, there is legislation in Congress right now. There's actually a, a couple of bills, you know, that are that are out there. And, um, you know, I mean, the thing is, folks who who are disabled, who advocate for the disabled, who advocate for the elderly, they've been saying this for decades, like we need to keep, the, we need to modernize this program. We need to update these limits. We need to put this into the 21st century. Um, and thankfully, thanks to all that good work that they've been doing, people are starting to listen. So there is actually bipartisan legislation right now in the Congress, in both houses, I would say, as well, to um, update these asset limits. There's also a more, much more comprehensive bill um, that would not only update the asset limits, but would update the income constraints that people have, as well as updating the benefits to make sure that everybody on SSI will be at least at least over the poverty line. Because right now, these benefits are so out of date, they're so low, that even with getting the benefit, four in 10 people on SSI are below the poverty line. And this was designed, intended to be something that keeps people out of poverty, a really baseline basic benefit, but it's not, it's failing even that test. Yeah. So, um, so that's how we change it. We got to change the law. So, um, and you know, the, the good news is there, there is some, some movement in Congress. Um, it's getting support from some interesting quarters, actually. There was a hearing uh, a few months ago where, where all of the big bank CEOs, Jamie Dimon and other people were, were asked, do you, do you think this makes sense? And do you think this needs updating? And, and actually they went right down the line. And interestingly, they all said, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. This needs to get updated. Well, I gotta so tell you, we cynic- may be close to a moment, hopefully. No, no, I gotta hopefully. tell you the cynical part of me, you know, having read your report, uh, that says that, you know, people on SSI uh, carry lower levels of debt, probably because nobody will give them credit uh, or the right. ability to get into debt. I think of bankers going, hey, here's an untapped group that we can <laughs> fleece. That's where, see, but that's where my jaded mind goes. I, I don't see a benevolency coming out of our banker crowd. Uh, there's got to be something in it for them. I hope, I hope above hopes that I'm wrong because I want better outcomes, but I got to tell yeah. you, um, I, I, I don't see it that way. <laughs> yeah. Our report didn't get into that. We, we didn't, we didn't address that, but we do know for sure that folks who are on SSI uh, and even disabled folks, we know from other research, disabled folks who, who aren't even on government support, uh, face a lot of credit constraints. They're discriminated against in housing markets, in credit markets. They can't get access to credit on reasonable terms. Uh, they're shut out or or they're fleeced. They, they end up paying much more in interest and fees for, for credit. Yeah, I thought you were going to go into that in the hearing. You know, we got some of our, our friends on the, the other side of the aisle who, who, who preach an awful lot. Uh, but don't actually practice saying, hey, you know, it's it's kind of in, you know, in the words that we should be taking care of the least among us. And, you know, how a society is judged on, on how they treat the the downtrodden and the poor and the uh, and the hungry and all that. I, I was hoping you were going there, but you know, maybe maybe for another day. So last question I've got for you, you know, in looking at, at our entire social safety net that's been dis- being you know, ripped to shreds since the Reagan years. Um, how likely is anything uh, happening? How likely is it anything happens? Uh, because sadly, I've been watching my whole lifetime as what little safety net that we've had uh, has been you know, torn to, asunder. Uh, what are the chances of something getting done on this? Um, you know, it's it's always so tough to speculate. And, you know, the the window, at least for this current Congress is closing because we're in an election year and it is always the situation that, you know, the further you get into the year, the fewer days that these folks are even in town to get things done and their their priorities are elsewhere, their attention is elsewhere. So, um, you know, there there is a window and um, 
I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we might be able to at least start getting some traction um, on some of these aspects. It would be wonderful to see a much more comprehensive approach to this. But honestly, I, I feel like from the from the advocates that I hear from, there there's just this sense of like, look, we'll we'll take anything as a win. Like it, you know, just just something that starts us in the right direction and we can build on that. Yeah. So um, you know, I think that's where we're at. Yeah, well, what's that saying about don't be the enemy of the of the the, the perfect? Uh, you know, get something done. Yeah, uh, it's that yeah, simple. Absolutely. Uh, so the answer to this is people need to be calling their representatives and saying, "Hey, how about doing something?" Right. That's that's how our system works. There you go, <laughs> uh, Beth. I appreciate you taking a little time, setting us straight, putting us in the right direction. Uh, really great talking with you. Oh, great to talk to you, too. Thanks so much for having me, Rick. Ah, good stuff. Beth, Beth Almeida, senior fellow there at the Center for American Progress. AmericanProgress.org, if you want to take a look at the work that they do. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick, at the RickSmithShow.com. Right back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1960. That was the day of the Sharpeville Massacre in South Africa. Black South Africans were required to carry identification documents. These passes limited who could live or work in designated white areas of the country. This restricted black workers from finding employment, especially in urban areas, if they did not have the required pass. Police would patrol the restricted areas looking for and arresting those without documentation. Black residents organized against this restrictive apartheid regime. At the township of Verning, a large crowd gathered numbering in the thousands. Petrus Tom, a factory worker who had become an organizer for the Metal and Allied Workers Union, described the plans that led up to the demonstration. Inside his factories, workers would wear away with the passes stickers. They organized at bus stops, urging workers getting off the buses to burn their passes in defiance of the restrictive law. Petrus said it was the strongest campaign I'd ever seen. The organizers called for a demonstration outside the local police police station. The plan was to turn themselves in for arrest for refusing to carry the pass. The police fired into the crowd of unarmed protesters, killing 69 people. 200 more were injured. Most of those shot by police were shot in the back as they were trying to flee the gunfire. Thousands of black South Africans were arrested in the days following the protest. Sharpeville became a watershed moment in the anti-apartheid struggle. In 1996, Nelson Mandela chose Sharpeville as the site to sign the country's new constitution. Today is now honored as Human Rights Day in South Africa. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got to tell you, you know, I, I look at the fact that our social safety net has been under attack for decades. You know, I go back to Ronald Reagan and look, uh, I grew up in the 70s where a lot of Johnson's Great Society programs were, uh, were, were enacted. And I still remember some of the things that, that did trickle down uh, to us a school lunch program in the summertime where, you know, in the housing project that I grew up in, uh, you went to Puritas elementary school and in the summertime uh, there was something, it wasn't much. It was a small little, you know, grilled cheese sandwich, beans and wieners, something, something like that, Uh, but very small and and like little tiny TV dinners. They weren't even full size. They were, you know, midget size, Uh, but it was something. Uh, It was, it was for a lot of those kids, the only hot meal that they were going to get that day because we lived in a very high poverty area. And I remember one of the things that Reagan did uh, during his presidency was eliminate that program, which meant that those kids, you know, weren't going to get that. And, you know, I I look at during the pandemic, uh, during the the Biden years where we said, hey, you know what, we're going uh, going to cut poverty in half, childhood poverty in half, by ensuring that families get a little bit of money. And that was the, the child tax credit. Uh, so you have this money that went to these families. 
uh, to help them put food on the table to make ends meet. You know, in a functional country, uh, we would have a, a social safety net uh, that actually helped people. Now, I argue, and I've argued this way before uh, for, for years now, a strong social safety net is great for, for the country because it gives people an opportunity to try and potentially fail. If you have a safety net under you, uh, trying and being a little entrepreneurial on one end is not a bad thing. But it also helps people who are truly, truly needy and truly need help. Something I think we've forgotten. You know, I'm, I'm often lectured by the, uh, the religious among us who, who like to, to preach a prosperity gospel. Without remembering, at least you know, when I grew up, you know, Jesus was about feeding the hungry and uh, healing the sick and clothing the naked and and all, visiting the uh, the infirmed and the in, imprisoned, uh, you know, that stuff. That's what a social safety net. If we truly are, if you're buying into the we're a Christian nation founded on Judeo Christian principles, if you buy that, and if that's your line. This should be your line of attack. We need a strong social safety net so that no one falls through the cracks. And I understand a lot of this has to do with, with, with race. A lot of this has to do with, with misogynistic male tendencies to say, well, those women should be with men. I'm going to get in trouble for that. I know. But it's true. Unfortunately, that's the reality of where we are. And you look at a lot of our safety net programs, they all come with really high bars. And I think a lot of people found that out during the pandemic. I, I know a couple of people who, you know, they, they, had, they had a hard time through the pandemic. And they went to go and get assistance and found out, oops, we got, we got too much. Uh, we're doing too well, uh, but we're, we're struggling. Sorry, you have assets. Sorry, you have, you know, something. And it's interesting that, you know, once, once you know, it comes home and, and, and bites you a little bit, it changes the perspective. For me, I'm always a believer of giving people a hand when they need it. Uh, I'm not a huge supporter of long-term handout programs. I am a huge supporter of, uh, of works programs. And ensuring that people have the dignity of work, but we're 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 nowhere near getting to that place. Uh, we're gonna do like we did during the Clinton years and the Gingrich years, and we're gonna mandate people get jobs when there are no jobs around. As someone who grew up in a housing project where there were no jobs and we were not on the bus line, um, that would have been a that would have been a death sentence, and that's what it was meant to be. It was a desperation sentence to get people to do really desperate things because hey we've got a prison industrial complex that needs beds and heads and i know i'm not allowed to make that that connection but sadly that's what happens now i was very fortunate and i and i and the reason that i believe a lot of the things that i talk about is because i was afforded the opportunity through some of these hand up programs uh we got food stamps as embarrassing and humiliating as it was to use them, it's how we were we fed ourselves. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to use uh, a Section 8 housing to get out of the project to get a little bit better opportunities. And when my mother passed away, my grandparents were able to collect the Social Security survivor benefit so that they could take care of me, so that they would be able to... Uh, oddly enough, pay the food bill because that's about all it covered, to be honest. It's not this great living. And I, I hear people all the time talk about, you know, you know, you know, people living basically high off the hog off of what is uh, a meager social program and the, the ideas of what, what people are being uh, afforded is, is well, imaginary. Because I've lived in those places where those policies are in place. I've been in those places where people exist on the little that we, we, we give them. And then we humiliate them and degrade them. Which is why I, I was really heartened. And, I, and I, I'm going to step back for a second. I was really heartened. Uh, my conversation the other day about the, the, the EBT cards and, and the, the person that I... Uh, I basically went up one side and down the other on uh, a lot of stories of people 
you know, saying, look, you know, I've been in those situations on both sides. Uh, on the side of seeing it happen and on the side of it happening to and sharing their stories. And I'm, I'm grateful for that because it, it does give me hope. And this is where I want to wrap this up because I do have hope that the decency, uh, that just common decency will, will win the day. I, I want to believe that more of us were raised by parents who taught us to respect each other, to care about each other, and to just be decent. I got to believe there are more of us than there are not. And maybe it's only the the most obnoxious, loudest voices that I hear and see uh, that gain my attention. And I'm grateful for the folks who who did take the time to go, hey, no, Rick, you know, you know, this, this is what happened. Uh, this is how, you know, how everything's working out. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy people shared that with me. Uh, and if you've got a story, I want to hear it as well. Rick at the Rick Smith show dot com. Uh, I do answer all emails personally. Uh, sometimes get a little bit backed up, but I will get to it. Uh, but I, I want to finish on this on this thought, and that is, you know, government, in my view, is how we solve problems and do the things that we can't do individually. We can end poverty. We can end, hung, end hunger. We can end homelessness. We can. We just have to want to. Appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for tuning in. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at Show.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.